beautiful star, the hope of light, guiding the pilgrim through the night. Over the mountain till the break of day, and into the light of perfect day, it will give out a lovely ray. Beautiful star. Before that God ever said, let there be light Before there was a grain of sand I was in the master's plan Oh, I was there, hallelujah, I was there Before this earth did appear or there was an atmosphere Before there ever was a star To grace the sky Oh, when the sons of God did sing Praising glory to the King Oh, I was there Hallelujah, I was there I was there, I was there Oh, hallelujah, I was there I was there, hallelujah, I was there Yes, I was there, oh, I was there Hallelujah, I was there I was there, hallelujah I was there Oh, when my Savior gave his life Oh, shed his blood and paid the price When mountains shook And the veil was rent in twain Oh, when the soldiers pierced the side He was travailing for his bride Oh, I was there Hallelujah, I was there Till the trump of God shall sound Oh, calling me 
to higher ground My eyes are fixed on Jesus Christ My Lord and God Soon he will call his waiting bride To be ever at his side Oh, I'll be there Hallelujah, I'll be there Oh, before this earth did appear For there was an atmosphere Before there ever was a star To grace the sky Think about it Oh, when the sons of God did sing Oh, praise and glory to the King I was there Hallelujah, I was there Oh, when the sons of God did sing Praise and glory to the King I was there Hallelujah, I was there. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We worship you in spirit and in truth. We worship you. Take our Bibles while we're standing. Let's look to 1 John. Pleasure to be with you. We appreciate the atmosphere. And 
Appreciate each one being here. As we just look into the word, I, I'd like to take for a, a title today, The Fellowship of the Attributes. The Fellowship of the Attributes. And I'd, I'd like to jump back to where we were last Sunday and kind of do a little bit of a review and maybe move a little bit forward. But I want to really capture this thought, and I don't want to go too fast and breeze too fast through it. So if you'll allow me just a little bit of time to readdress that. First John chapter 1, verse 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Let's ask the Lord's blessing over the reading of the word. Lord Jesus, we thank you that we can once again be here, Lord. That we can gather in this fashion, Lord, with our brothers and sisters. And Lord, we've sung, Lord, we've sung praises and worship to you. And you told us that you abide in the praises of your people. Lord, we believe that you're here because your word says wherever two or three are gathered in your name, you'll be in their midst. And I pray now you would find welcome here, Lord. That we'd receive you, Lord, in the way that you come. That you would find a welcome in us, Lord. that we would listen to your word and hear it, Lord, and that you would feed us by your own hand, that we might grow stronger in this day and age that we live. Open our eyes, Lord, that we might see and give us a heart to perceive and receive all of your word. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. You can all be seated. I would like to keep looking at the scripture for just a minute, and I want to look at verse six. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness... We lie and do not the truth, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light. This is a super important scripture that we catch and understand this. As we walk in the light as he is in the light. So that's present tense current light, amen? And that light is the revealed word for our day, for the day and age that we live in, that is light, amen? The revealed word for our day is light. So we must walk in the light as he is in the light, amen? So let's read that again. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. So we realize without this revealed word, amen, walking in the light of this revealed word, we do not even have fellowship with each other. There's There's not even a basis for fellowship outside this revealed word. Uh, you know, because sometimes a lot of things gets called fellowship that's not fellowship. And, and there are things that are not wrong. I mean, there's a lot of things that we do when we get together and visit with one another and catch up. That's not fellowship, but it's also not bad. You know, it's not wicked to find out how work's going for a brother and how the family's doing and things like that. We should know about each other and love each other. That's part of the family of God. But when we really get down to fellowship, fellowship is not just dinner. Fellowship is, is not just volleyball. It's not getting together for games or for recreation. Fellowship is walking in the light as he is in the light will give us fellowship with one another. Because we are children of the light and the children of, of the light can only fellowship in the light of the age that they live in. So let's read this again. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So the cleansing, the cleansing of the blood is in the washing of the water by the word, amen? Brother Bram ties those things together. It's by the washing of the water by the word because we're sanctified by the spirit, which is the life that was in that blood, amen? And if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse us from all sin. So it's imperative that the, that the children of God walk in the light of God. That's why it's so important to preach the revelation of the hour and preach the prophet's message, amen? There's no way, there's no way to reconcile anybody back to God without this word, amen? It's an impossibility. You can get somebody's heart turned towards a, a historical Jesus, and I don't, I don't say that derogatory. I don't mean that bad in any way, so just hang with me. You can get their heart turned to the story of what God's done and how God has always worked and brought us through and how God has paid the price of redemption redemption, but the way to get them reconciled back to God is to bring them to the word for their day. Because that's who he is. He is the word. He is the revealed word. So we, ha- we have to preach 
the gospel, the good news. What is the good news? The message of the hour. It is the good news. So I want to look at this word fellowship just for a minute. We have fellowship one with another. And this fellowship in the Greek, it's interpreted many different ways. Fellowship, communion, communication. And if they give uh, uh, definitions at the bottom, say fellowship, association, a community, a communion, a joint uh, participation. The share which one has in anything, participation. So if we have fellowship with one another, it's something that we're joining in and we have a part in and a participation in. And so this walking in the light as he is in the light will give us fellowship with one another because we become part of, we have a share in, we begin to participate in the same thing. That's what fellowship is, friends. It's participating in this same thing together. Let's turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 9. God is faithful by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So you're not called to the fellowship of a church. You're not called to the fellowship, but you're called to the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. You're called to that joint participation. You have a share in that. You're part of that community. Amen. The fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So I want to I wanna read. This is a little bit of review here, but I want to read from Satan's Eden it says, now that's the way God was in the beginning. Every son of God and every daughter of God was in God at the beginning. You don't remember it now, but you were there. He knowed it and he wanted you to become so he could contact you, speak with you and love you and shake your hands. This is an amazing statement. God had a plan and God had a desire. And part of that desire, amen, in his thoughts, we, be, we were sons and daughters of God. We were attributes of him in his thinking before the foundation of the world. But he wanted a, a further manifestation, amen, for another level of fellowship together. Amen. So God in his thinking, we know his thoughts are his attributes. In his attributes, God wanted fellowship with the attributes. In the message, Spiritual Amnesia, he says, now, to be a true Christian, you have to be the same. We don't want to forget that all that he was, I'm identified with him. I'm identified with him. Notice, and he is in me and I in him. Notice, then every Christian that's a real genuine Christian was with him. When the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy, before there was a foundation of the world, we were identified in the, mortal, in the immortal realms with God 10 million years before the world was ever formed. I was back there with him. If I got eternal life, I was there with him. I was identified with him when the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy. Question is, were you there? Amen. If you were there, you had fellowship with God before. Amen. And God's great desire was fellowship. To be a family, to have fellowship with his attributes. And he had fellowship with the attributes in his thinking. And he wanted another expression and more fellowship in the other expression. So this is really important. This is why God is doing what he's doing. Friends, it's, it's when, when, when we have by the message of the hour, the ability to go back, amen. Uh, that's why I enjoyed Brother Tellus' song. It was very timely, amen. We go back, further back, amen. Go back before the story started on earth and back before the fall in the Garden of Eden, back before the war in heaven, to go back and realize that God had a desire. And that desire God had was to have fellowship with his attributes, amen. And so he was going to, he was going to divide himself up. Now, now, these are just human terms. Because God divide himself up makes him no less God, amen? It's not like he portions a piece off here and now there's only 60% of God, 30% over there. God's not changing, amen? How he does it, I don't quite understand. But God is, is his attributes, a, a portion of himself. He's going to have come out in a manifestation to unite back with himself because that's what he wants. So your existence started not when your mom and dad got married, amen, not when your birth certificate uh, announced your arrival, amen, but your existence started back there when you had fellowship before with God. Amen. 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 
Now remember, the basis of fellowship, amen, with one another is walking in the light as he is in the light. Amen. God is so good. Now, we were there. Now, if you can say from the bottom of your heart, I was there. Like, I, I don't understand it. Amen. The, I don't comprehend it. I don't remember it. Amen. But there's some witness in my heart that says that's the truth. Amen. I believe what the prophet's saying. Amen. I, I see that that is true. Amen. Then what on earth do you have to worry about, friends? What problem will take you? What thing is there that's too big that's not going to be handled? What's not already been addressed in the mind of God? You were there before, amen? Your destination is secure. Your name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundation of the world, and it was sealed, and that seal wasn't removed to the end time, and the only time that the seal was removed was not to put your name in jeopardy, but to give you a revelation of who you really are. So you were secure from before the foundation of the world and your security didn't change at the opening of the seals. The opening of the seals was to show you how secure you've always been. So now why do we cower so much when the devil begins to fume and when the devil begins to threaten and begins to stomp and scare us with symptoms and scare us with circumstances, amen? Why is it we cower so badly? Amen, we've got to stop acting like, amen, stop acting like we just existed here on this earth and we only have capacity as human beings. We've got to realize where we came from, where we're going and who's in control. These circumstances are nothing outside the mind of God. These things, these afflictions, these symptoms, amen, they're not beyond God's knowledge and God had a plan before the foundation of the world and it wasn't for me to be a loser, it was for him to overcome through me because he's got a goal in mind and he had a goal in mind from before the foundation, amen. When I was a thought in his mind, he showed us the goal and we rejoiced and sang and shouted and clapped our hands, amen? That's why Brother Bram tells that story we told last Sunday about about the old preacher, amen, in Mishawaka, said, you don't have room for me to preach. He says, you call this, this is a quote that Brother Bram quotes this preacher, this old preacher, 90 some years old. He says, you say I got this new religion. He said, it's the oldest religion there is, this singing, shouting, clapping, dancing religion started all the way back in the mind of God when the sons of God shouted for joy. Amen. That enthusiasm you have now, it's not new, friends. This revelation that's coming forth, that's stirring your heart and making you a thrilled and shouting amen and clapping your hands, amen, is not new. It's old. Actually, it's not even old. It's eternal. It didn't have a time it began. It didn't have a start. Amen. It was always there. And when God was was fellowshipping with his attributes in his mind. Now, I know that sounds funny, but we're going to read some quotes so you can understand what I'm saying. Amen. When God was fellowshipping with the attributes in his mind, you were one of those attributes. And it's not so much the material out of the earth that you're made of now, that'll be redeemed, that'll be the vessel that this attribute lives in, but it's the attribute, the seed, the germ of God, the gene of God, the portion of the word, the part of the life. I mean, brother man, there's so many terms for that. Don't get caught up in terms. What it is is a part of God, a part of that life, a part of that word, a part of that thought. And that was you, amen? And that's the genuine you, that's the real you, that was to be you. And what brings such confusion is hybridization in a fall because now what was to be you, this was supposed to be the whole regulating force of you, of your triune being. You were supposed to be, you were supposed to have a soul with this germ of life in it, amen. You were supposed to have a theophany body or a theophany spirit that was perfect and a body that was not fallen. So everything was in harmony, amen. But because of the fall of man, amen, now your outer man is in disharmony with your inner man. And that's what creates so much confusion because it all depends on what you identify with. Amen, if you identify with the outer man, then you're no good and you're not worthy and you're not capable and how could he choose me and oh, me, uh, me a worthless this and me a worthless that. I don't see how God could choose me. Well, he didn't wake up in the morning and say, um, him, her, him, her. 
I don't know. Some days, yes. Some days, no. But that's exactly how we act. And when we ask questions like that, how could he choose me? I mean, there's nothing wrong with that realization that the outer man is worthless, amen? Cannot attain to God, cannot get it right. And there's a, there's a hopelessness and a despair when looking at the outer man. And there's nothing wrong with that because it brings the right kind of humility. But if we stay there, we never realize that it wasn't based off conduct, merit, performance, outer man, anything. It was based off his foreknowledge because he knew what ground, what dirt his, his seed was going to land in. And that was what was predestinated. That germ of life was what was predestinated. And so... That's the part that he sees as perfect. That's the part that he's redeeming back. But God in his mind wanted us in a triune being because God is manifest in a triune being and he wants his attributes manifest in a triune being and he wants fellowship in triune beings. Why, Brother Chad? I don't know. But that's what he does. That's what he wants. That's the way he wants it. And so that was foiled. That plan was foiled. It, was, it, was, it went into corruption in the garden. But God is bringing it back because that was his purpose from the beginning. So, so many times we hear, we, we, we defy our own faith by the words that come out of our mouth. We identify with the fallen creature and we don't identify with the seed gene of God. And, and like I said before, there's nothing wrong with the right understanding that I, in my flesh and in my mind, am, am incapable. That should always be a part of our understanding. If not, we'll get lifted up in pride, we'll have too much self-confidence, and we will get flattened. So there's a good, healthy dose of, of, uh, uh, of an inability in the outer man, and it's healthy to understand that me as a person, me as a human being, me as this creature, the outer man realm, I, I'm, I'm just toast. I'm finished. That's why you can say, God, without you, I can do nothing. I can never get it right. I will never get it right. I've never been able to get it right. Amen. But I'm so glad that before the foundation, you saw that it would become right. And you made every, you made every, everything that needed to be fixed, you fixed. And everything that needed to be set, you set. And everything that needed to be tuned, you tuned so that we could get there. Because you knew I couldn't do it. That's why he came to Abraham with an unconditional covenant because no conditional covenant with human beings was going to work. So he come with an unconditional covenant because it was the only way that God can guarantee the promise to the seed was to make it unconditional. Not you, if you do, I will, but I have already done it. Let's go on here. Serpent seed. And from 1958, he says, Dear God, the great and mighty God who formed all things by the power of spirit and has brought Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, who freely died for we sinners, the just for the unjust, to reconcile us back into his marvelous fellowship that we have again with God. We had a marvelous fellowship, and he wants to reconcile us back to fellowship. Yeah that we have again with God as we are taught in the blessed word that we had fellowship with him before the foundation of the world. When the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy way back before the foundation of the world, how do we know that that wasn't at the same time that the lamb was slain, that when God in his great thinking seen us shouting and rejoicing in our salvation through Jesus? He had, we had fellowship with him as attributes in his thinking before the foundation of the world. And the only way to have fellowship restored is to come to the light, to the present day light. Amen. And the present day light will restore us to fellowship that we had with him. Amen. And we live, listen, we live in such a special time. I know we talk about 2020 and the world falling apart in chaos, but this, as far as the gospel is concerned, is the most special time that we've ever had on the face of the earth. Who else besides us knew what was going on in the mind of God before the foundation of the world? Who else had such a security, amen? Who else had such an understanding of what went wrong in the garden, what, what went wrong in heaven, what he's doing to restore it all, and how secure the whole thing is at the opening of the seals? Nobody, no other generation has had what we have. 
So the world's falling apart. Let it fall apart. Amen. There's something better that's been open to me. Amen. I'm not putting stock in this world anymore because I realize that I've got a greater inheritance. Amen. That everything that I'm walking on will belong to me as a joint heir one day. And I don't want it this way anyhow. Buy a piece of land. I wanted this and I want to go. I, I don't want any of this the way it is. It's rotten. It's corrupt. Amen. It's, it's degrading itself day by day. Amen. But everything that was made by God, amen, is going to be renovated by, the fi- by fire. Amen. And I will become a possessor of this earth, a joint heir of the whole thing. So if it all goes away, amen, if tomorrow, amen, the laws change and we lose privileges and they take things away, so what? This isn't the one that I'm hoping for anymore. Amen, the opening of the seals, the opening of the word has brought such a revelation, amen, that the devil should be losing his ability to trouble us. Come on, brother. You know, we... we like I said before, we say things we ought not to say and we identify with the wrong realm. And it's habit because we've done it all of our existence on earth, all of our lives in this flesh. We've, we've identified with this outer man. But, but the prophet of God says such marvelous things to us. And in fact, that when, when he said, I quoted before, but he said, you've never really seen me. Oh, praise God. Amen. Amen. I can say the same thing. You've never really seen me. You've only seen the vessel, the tent, the tabernacle that I've got a temporary dwelling in. So if it goes, it goes. Let it go. But I don't want to anymore defy the revelation of the word by identifying with the outer realm and saying things that I shouldn't say. But I, with all my heart, want to say what the word says. And what this revelation of the hour, the way, the way it describes me is the way I want to be described and the way I want to believe. I want to identify with what the messenger has taught. I don't want to identify what, what the devil is trying to, to condemn with me with or trying to uh, point out in flaws and in failures, you know, because I realize I never did it in the first place. But the prophet said, he may have a rap sheet a mile long, but the prophet of God said, you never did it in the first place. He said, he said, you come into this world, married to that of no fault of your own. You were trapped into it. I say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that I can throw all of that away and say, I never did in the first place because in the first place I was in the mind of God. In the first place I was one of those attributes shouting and dancing and rejoicing at the plan of God. In the first place, the first thought he had, the first desire was not this form. And I'm going back to the first place. I will go back to that first place, to that original condition in the mind of God. What he wanted, what he thought will become materialized, and I am going to move to that place. What's going to move there? Whatever this life is inside of me that he's designated to be me is going to move there. You can call it whatever you want to call it. Brother Bram calls it lots of things. I don't always know what to call it, but it's a part of God that he, that he designated to be me, Amen. my portion. Now, I want to read uh, a quote out of the Smyrna Church Age. I'm trying to uh, hold back and go slow so that we can just really understand what the prophet's saying, and not just understand what he's saying, but the implication it should have in our lives. That's the thing that I get so troubled with with myself is it takes absolutely nothing, nothing to get me so bothered and so troubled and and so despondent and discouraged and depressed and and, and wondering what's wrong and why everything's falling apart. And And I'm like, what is wrong with me? Amen. We've had a message like no other time on the face of the earth to give us a true identity. What am I worried about? Nothing is wrong. Everything is fine. 
And I want to stay with that revelation and the implication of that revelation so that I quit getting tossed about, tossed to and fro with every wind of trouble and every wind of discouragement and every, every difficulty, amen? I want to stay with the word so that I can keep marching forward and that he can overcome through me because I'm not, I'm not, I'm not circumventing my own success by all the words that I say and all the things that I allow to, to, to stay in my mind. I want to just believe what he's taught us in this day and what the scriptures say about us. And this morning, church age, out of the church age book, he says, now, according to the word of God, the bride was chosen before the foundation of the world. This choosing of the bride was purposed in himself, Ephesians 1.9. This is one of the most amazing, to me, it's one of the most amazing scriptures that he purposed this in himself. That means he didn't ask your opinion. He didn't check with you first. He, he didn't wait to see how you would do. He already purposed in himself that this is what he's going to do. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world according to his own will. He purposed it within himself. He has already determined it and he is not going to change his mind. And it doesn't matter how many times my mind changes. It doesn't matter how confused I get or how many times this belief passes through my mind. His purpose, his plan, his will is not changing. Oh, praise God. And in Romans 9, 11, it says that the purpose of God according to election might stand. You can't read it any other way. The heart purpose, the eternal purpose of God was take a bride of his own choosing. <laughs> Oh, the heart purpose of God, the eternal purpose of God was to take a bride of his own choosing. Now we all say, amen, that's the truth. But I want to ask you, are you a bride of his own choosing? You as an individual, has he chose you? Has he given you the revelation of his choosing? Do you know that your name was on that book before the foundation of the world, that you're part of that bride that he chose? Amen. That's the revelation we need to overcome in this hour. Not just say, yeah, the bride was chosen. Yeah, there was names on the book. But say, my name was on that book before the foundation world. I was in his mind. He chose me according to his own purpose, and he's not going to lose me. He's not going to leave me behind. He's not going to throw me away, but he's going to fulfill his purpose. And I just want to believe it. His heart purpose, the eternal purpose of God was take a bride of his own choosing. And that purpose was in himself, and being eternal was decreed before the foundation of the world. Watch carefully now and see this. Before there was ever a speck of stardust, before God was God, God is an object of adoration, and no one was there to worship him. So he was at the time only potentially God. And he was known only as eternal spirit. The bride was already in his mind. Yes, she was. She was existing in his thoughts. I want you to catch this. She was existing in his thoughts. Amen. This isn't, he's going to go on to say this. I, I'll just read more because I'm going to mess it up. She was existing in his thoughts. And what about those thoughts of God? They are eternal, are they not? The eternal thoughts of God. Let me ask you, are the thoughts of God eternal? If you can see this, you will see many things. Say, Lord, let me see this. Let me see this so that I can see many things. God is unchangeable in both essence and behavior. We have studied that and proven that already. God is infinite in his abilities, so therefore he, he, as God, must be omniscient. If he is an omniscient, then he is not now learning, nor is he taking counsel even with himself, nor is he at any time adding to his knowledge. If he can add to his knowledge, then he is not omniscient. The best we could say is that sometime he will be, but that is not scriptural. He is omniscient. He has never had a new thought about anything because all his thoughts he has he has always had and always will have and knows the end from the beginning because he is God. Thus, the thoughts of God are eternal. They are real. They are not simply like a man with a blueprint he has drawn up in which one day will be translated into substance and form, but they are already real and eternal and part of God. 
Now, I'm not even going to try to explain how that works because I, I only have a, a human brain and understand as a man, but God's is not, his thinking is not like our thinking. His thoughts are so much higher than our thoughts is what he says. So his thoughts are not like a man, so we cannot even, we cannot even relate to this in our human existence, but God, it says she, the bride, she was existing in his thoughts. Listen, friends, she was there in existence, real, eternal, not a fleeting thought that, you you know, I have thoughts all the time. And five minutes later, I'm like, what was that I was just thinking about? I can't remember. I should have wrote it down. I've lost that thought. Amen. That's not how God's thoughts are. But God's thoughts are a part of himself. You understand? God's thoughts are a part of his being. Amen. It's not like us. We can have a thought and a thought passes through a mind that didn't come from us. That happens all the time. But God's not like that. God's thoughts are a part of himself. And when he had these thoughts, these eternal thoughts of his bride, amen, this was his eternal purpose to have a bride of his own choosing. And these thoughts existed in his mind before time. So you can say, if I am one of those thoughts, I existed before the foundation of the world. Because they are real, they are eternal, they're not fleeting, they're not an imagination. They, they They are real, they are eternal, they are existing. Now, we're just going to have to accept that because I don't think any of us can understand it or explain it. And if you can explain it, come see me later because I don't have a clue how to explain that. But something in me says, amen. It's the only way. It's the only way that this can work because men will fail every time. It's the only way, friends. And the message possessing the gate of the enemy after the trial. He says, and remember... If you never was in God's thoughts, you'll never be with God. How many knows that he was a redeemer? Well then, anything redeemed has to come back to where it fell from. So if he come to redeem us, how could he was one time didn't, was one time didn't have to be redeemed. One time you didn't have to be redeemed, but now you have to be redeemed. That means you were in a position or a place that didn't need redemption at one point. But now you need redemption. So God in redemption is going to bring you back to that place where you don't need redemption. Praise God. At at one time, didn't have to be redeemed, and we were all born in sin, shaped in iniquity, come to the world speaking lies. It shows that the real Christian is an attribute of God's thinking. Before there was a world or a star or air or anything else, it's eternal, and he come to redeem us back. It's God's thought spoken to a word, made manifest, and brought back to his thought. That's redemption. Brought back to his thought, what he was thinking of, what he desired. In 1965, in the message, Lean Not to Thine Own Understanding, he says, so you see, if you were in the foreknowledge of God, then you are becoming a part of God. And the only way you can be a son of God or a daughter of God, you had to be a part of God, and God isn't complete without you. I want you to understand this. Uh, I want to understand, I should say, I want to understand this better because God isn't complete without you because whatever that thought was that was existing, that was real, that was eternal, that thought has moved down into me. So listen, this, this is showing us how real those thoughts are. It was a thought, but that thought, that portion of God, that attribute of God, that gene of God, that germ of God, that thought, that word, whatever, that thought was predestinated to be in me, and that part is in me, and it is the true me. And now without that part, God is incomplete. So how real is that thought? It's pretty real. So now without that portion that's, that's, that is in your soul, without that portion, God is incomplete. So isn't God, uh, I just want to ask you, is God in jeopardy of remaining incomplete? Is there a chance that at the end of the story, God will have miscalculated and a few pieces get lost somewhere? And he has to continue on incomplete. 
You see, I say that in jest, but, but we act as though, we talk as though, we conduct ourselves as though that I, at some point I could just be cast away. I may not even be one of them. I, I don't even know. I just failed and I'm not it no more. If you were ever it, you're always it. I mean, if you were ever, if you were ever redeemed, if you were ever redeemable, you're always redeemable. You were always redeemed in the mind of God. You cannot be lost. You cannot be separated because you're a part of God and God is incomplete without you. Amen. So we got to quit acting like I'm in one day, out the next, in one day, out the next. If you were ever in, you're always in. Sometimes what we got to do is just tell the devil to shut up. We don't have to identify with every thought that comes in our mind. The only thought that we identify is the one that matches the word. The, Brother Branham said, he said, the non-elect don't even want this position. Don't even ask for it. Don't even, they're not troubled about it all the time. They're not tur in turmoil about, am I pleasing God? Am I one of the elect? Am I bride? The non-elect aren't even asking those questions. They're just going on, going to a denominational church, assuming everything's fine and happy that way. So just tell the devil to shut up. If God's given you a revelation of who you are, hold on to that revelation. If the revelation you got matches the word, hold on to it. Amen. We have had, we have had something no other age has ever had. Let's not take it lightly. Let's take the full implication of what's been said and the full value of what's been delivered to us. We shouldn't be acting like they acted in Luther's day. We shouldn't be, we shouldn't be speaking things that they spoke in Wesley's day. We shouldn't be talking like they talked in the Pentecostal day, amen. We should be speaking like they speak in the bride age, amen. Because there's been an eagle anointing to fly higher than all the denominations and showed us the whole plan of God from before the foundation of the world to the new heavens and new earth. And he's also revealed to us our place in that by, the indivi by individually Jesus Christ revealing himself to you as an individual, placing you in that plan. Don't ever let the devil's lies pull you out. If you're ever there, you're always there. So God, let's read this again and lean out to your understanding. You're a daughter of God, son of God, daughter of God. You had to be part of God and God isn't complete without you. Has to be, that's right. Because there is one, only one source of eternal life and that is God and him alone has eternal life. Now you were a part of him in so much that you're an attribute or in his thinking in the beginning. And that because he thought of you in the beginning, it gives that little tug towards him. Yes. That what, that's what has to be quickened. Some of them will never be quickened. They just don't have it. That's all. <clears throat> have you felt a little tug towards God? <laughs> Has the message of the hour pulled at your heart? then you should be able to raise your hand and shout and rejoice and say, praise God. Amen, I feel like shouting because there's something in there that God can tug on because there's souls out there, there's nothing to tug on. There's nothing that the message can tug on. There's nothing to get a hold of, nothing to pull on, amen. But if there's something that's pulling us and won't let us go and won't turn us loose, no matter how much we fail, no matter how much we backslide or doubt, amen, but something's there that keeps tugging, we should raise our hands and thank God because that something there was not something we put there. It doesn't come from our minds, amen. It came from the mind of God and it was implanted there by predestination and it's the guarantee that he He's going to make sure that grace comes to his seed. Amen. Don't discount those things. Don't throw them away. Amen. We have those. I mean, God deals with us so powerfully. God deals with us so personally. Amen. And the devil will come in and trouble our mind. And we're willing to throw this thing away for some thought in our mind. What the prophet told us, the way he explained it, and the realization we have in ourselves and the experience we have with God that matches that message, that matches that word, and the devil will come in and tell you that you were wrong the other day when you said that, and, and you actually lied about that, and, and you should have never spoke this way, and you shouldn't have said that, and you should have never looked at that. Amen. You might not even be one of them. 
Show me that in the Word. You say, devil, you're right. I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have done that, and I shouldn't have done that, 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 and that. But God put something in me to believe, and I didn't put it there. And I can't take it out. I believe. Something deep, deeper than my mind. Deeper than the confusion that comes to mind. Deeper than the questions. There's something deeper that believes. That's that seed gene of God. That's what has to be quickened. That part that he's tugging at is the part that he's making alive. Brother Brown says that Satan's eating. And so God knew that we would be here. But then he put us in flesh so we, so we would be we would be contacted in order he could contact. He became one of us when he became Jesus Christ, the son of God himself, the fullness of the manifestation of God. Therefore, that was God's purpose to display his attributes in fellowship. So one of God's purposes was to display his attributes in fellowship. God wants to fellowship with his attributes. He wants to display his attributes in fellowship. When I was in my father, I knew nothing about it, but when I became his son and was born of him, I was an attribute, a part of my father, and you're a part of your father. And as children of God, we are part of God's attribute that was in him, made flesh like he was made flesh, so we can have fellowship one with the other as a family of God upon the earth. And that was God's purpose at the beginning. Yes, sir, that's what God wanted at the beginning. What did God want? God wanted, amen, he wanted us to come into flesh. He wanted us to be a family on the earth to have fellowship with one another. Why? Because when I have fellowship with you, if you have that seed gene of God on you, it's been quickened to life. When I have fellowship with you, I'm having fellowship with God. Understand? God wanted his attributes he wanted to manifest his attributes in fellowship. That's why we can only have fellowship one another if we walk in the light as he is in the light. Amen. Because if we get outside of that word, amen, we're outside of the fellowship, but we have to be in the word as he is in the word. The message for our day brings us to a place of fellowship. The attributes of God are fellowshipping. How are they fellowshipping? They're fellowshipping by the revelation of the word. So that when I fellowship with you, amen, you, you, you realize now when I begin to fellowship with you, I'm fellowshipping with my bridegroom. Because it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. You understand? When, I, when we have fellowship together in the light of this age, amen, it is Christ coming together. Because we are the body of Christ, amen? United together in fellowship under the banner of the word, amen? And when this body unites, it is Christ and every member is Christ. So when I have fellowship with you, I'm having fellowship with Christ. When you're having fellowship with me, you're having fellowship with Christ. And you may see, oh, this is, what, this is where we have to go beyond human thinking because you'll see me and you'll see my little mannerisms that I picked up from dad. And you'll see my little sense of humor I got from mom. And, and you'll see even some ways that, that it's a little bit irritating. <laughs> we'll be honest. I wish... I like Brother Chad, but I just wish he wasn't so. Every once in a while, I just get on my nerves. I use me, because if I use somebody else, I'd be in big trouble. But you can use your imagination. But you see what I'm saying? We see the flesh part that come through hybridization, that come from a mom and dad. We can see, you, you, you can see there's a little bit of irritability, there's some irresponsibility here, there's a flightiness in here, there's a dogmatism there. And we see those things, amen, but you gotta realize that package is packaged because of the fall. But there's another life inside that wants to bloom out in that package. 
and take control. And we've got to move beyond all the little things of the flesh. We've got to go deeper and say, that's my brother. If that was on my brother, then we were in God in the beginning. And when God's thoughts were material and real, him and I were shouting together. She and I were shouting when we saw the plan of redemption, when we had a conference with God in the mind of God as attributes of God. We were shouting together. Amen. We come from the same place. We're part of the same material. We are part of the same thing, the same substance. And if God allowed this hybridization to bring this one down, and this one's a little more dogmatic, and this one is, is, is a little short with the fuse, and this one's a little flighty, then God wants to use it for a purpose. There's something he wants to display. And he wants to display it here and here and here. <clears throat> Amen. And he's still going to have his way through everything because it's the attributes of God coming up through. And so we have God. What does God want? God wants a family of God on earth fellowshipping with one another. And that fellowship is based on walking in the light as he is in the light. Brings us into this fellowship together. And now we realize that you are part of me and I'm part of you. That's why Jesus could say in that day you'll know that I am you, you and me. I am the father, the father and me. Well listen, if you can take yourself and put yourself Let's just say, I'm going to put myself in that equation. Yeah, amen. I and you, you and me, I and the Father, Father and me. Brother Branham said, making them all one. Yeah. Well, if Brother Brandon, Brian can put himself in the same place, then where's he? And where am I? And who's he and who am I? Now, if I'm looking at the outer man, I'm looking at two different people. But if I'm going to the root, amen, if I'm tracing the root of this organism all the way back, I'm looking at one life, amen, one eternal life from one eternal source with one plan of God. Amen. We are part of the same thing, which will be the family of God manifest in different manifestations upon this earth in perfection. And then that thing about me that used to irritate you will not irritate you in the new heavens and new earth. Because God will finally have polished it clear out of me. So you better start loving me now. That's why fellowship is so critical, friends, because when we reject fellowship and run off by ourselves, we are actually rejecting the body of Christ. And when we want to say, you know, this, this, and that, that, just forget all of the little nuances and all of the little attitudes and all of the little, forget all of that and go deeper. This is my brother. This is my sister. At some point, none of these things will matter anyways. At some point, our little different ideas and our little differences, they will not matter at some point. But that is my brother. That is my sister. I will embrace them as part of Christ. And when we dismiss fellowship, you know, sometimes, you, you listen, the reality is we can get our feelings hurt. Can, I'd rather say will. Have and will and will again. I mean, this is a, this is a human life and a fallen outer man. You can get your feelings hurt. Things can go different to your liking. Uh, you can have... People step on you, not even be intentionally maybe, or maybe it was intentionally, it doesn't matter. Whatever happens. But the devil is trying to pull us away from fellowship and get us over in isolation all by ourselves. And then, then we begin, begin to believe all kinds of lies that way. We begin to be, believe lies like, like they're all wrong, I'm the only one who knows, and they don't see it. But God has got a body on this earth. And these attributes should be connected in fellowship because it's part of the same body. We need one another. We need to hold on to one another, embrace one another because it's not just you, the outer exterior flesh, but there's something in you that I love. There's something in you that I love with, without emotion. Yes. Yes. It brings emotion, but there's something that's agape love. There's something that's high. There's something in you I love because whatever it is that's in you, I loved when we were together. Yes. Existing as real in the thoughts of God. Right. You and I were standing next to each other and we loved each other there. Right. 
And that's why we have the ability to love each other here, amen, because we can go deeper than the skin, deeper than the mind, deeper than all those things, and I can see there's a life in there, amen, it's the same life that I have. It comes from the same source. We have the same father. We're part of the same family. We're both walking in the light as he is in the light. Amen. That puts us in fellowship together as the attributes of God fellowshipping on the earth. Listen, that's what his purpose was from the beginning. Why can't we start fellowshipping on the earth now? attributes of God in fellowship, walking in the light as he is in the light, embracing one another, amen, as, as, as both being part of the same thing. Praise God. In the message, sirs, we would see Jesus from 64. He says, now, if you were in his thinking at the beginning, if you've got eternal life, there is only one form of eternal life. Eternal life had no beginning and it has no ending. So if you have eternal life, you were an attribute of God's thinking before there was anything but him. You understand that? Brother Branham said at this stage, he wasn't even God yet. Because God is an object of worship. I mean, he was the same person, he was the same substance, but he didn't have the title. Before there was angels to worship and before he had the title of God, you were there. So tell me what can take you away from your position? What demon? You were before demons. You were before Lucifer. You understand, there's no force that can remove you from the love of Christ, from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. There's no force, there's no demon power, there's no force seen or unseen that can separate you away, amen, because you were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. That is secure. His love was set. His love was secure. That is the expression of his grace. Amen. So don't say something different than that. Can anything separate us from the love of God? Well, the next time you mess up and condemnation comes, you did this and you did that and you did that, we start to believe that our conduct has separated us from the love of God. You understand? We begin to believe in our minds that because of this action and this action and this action, I have separated myself from the love of God. The love of God was set before the foundation of the world. Before you did right or wrong, he said, Esau have I loved, or Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated. Before either was born, before either had a chance to do good or evil. So don't, don't change the word of God, amen, by your own wrong thinking, amen. Your actions aren't separating from you the love of God. The love of God is fixed, amen. Your actions are putting you outside of blessings. They're, they're causing you to remove yourself from the word and remove yourself from the source of blessings, but it's not changing the love of God or your position in God. So what do you do, Brother Chad? Repent. Repent, say, God, that was wrong. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. But don't lose your sonship over it. Don't throw away all the promises in the Bible. Don't lose your security that was revealed in the seals. Amen, don't, re don't lose the rejoicing, the shouting, the clapping, the singing when you see the plan of salvation. Don't lose that fellowship you had with God from before the foundation of the world. Don't lose that joy that thrilled your heart at the opening of the seals. What thrilled you at the opening of the seals? What was it that was so exciting? Was it that you now knew what a white horse was? I now know what a white horse, whoa, I'm a new man. What changed you is you realized that this revelation coming to you was calling your name, that you believed it, and he was saying, you're part of this. You're the name that was there. All of these things, I'm showing you what I've done, how I've redeemed my whole plan, because now I've come to the end of that plan, and I'm showing you what the plan was so that I can open the book and show you your name is on this book. That's what thrilled our hearts at the opening of the seals. Don't let anything change that. How can you change that? You can't change what's in that book. So, just, just 
stick with the word. Just believe what he said. Say what the tapes say. Say it. I mean, if they hook you to a lie detector and the lie detector goes off red, 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 he's lying, I'd say it anyways. Because I believe that word before I believe my own thoughts and my own flesh body and my own ability to perspirate and get nervous when I begin to say things. The word is still true regardless of my reaction, regardless of my thoughts, regardless of my mind. The word is true, always true, always will be true. I want to say what the tapes say. I want to say what the scriptures say and not say what I'm feeling right now. Because if you wait 15 minutes, your feelings will change, amen, but this word will never change. God's feeling for you won't change. His love for you won't change. Your position in him won't change. But your feelings will change. Your thoughts will change. Your understanding will change. So stick with the word. Praise God. We're still reading in Sirs We Would See Jesus from 1964. Like I said, this is review. This is a lot of review, but this is so important, friends. This is a revelation. This is something we've heard and heard and heard, but the implication has got to change our lives. The implication has got to be manifest in the way we speak, in the way we act, in the way we view things around us. This, this is statements with implications. The implications have to become tangible. It's got to, it's got to stop being conceptual. It's got to stop being an idea that's exciting. It's got to stop being something Brother Branham said that I can say amen to or the preacher gets everybody riled up by saying these things. It's got to move from conceptual, a thrilling concept. It's got to be tangible in our lives where I say, that's me. That's the truth. That's the reality. And everything else is a lie. So we'll repeat it and we'll repeat it and we'll repeat it and we'll repeat it till something inside clicks and say, that's not a neat idea. That's who I am. It's not a neat concept. It's not something I say amen to. It's exciting. It is something that's real inside of me. Praise God. He says, your form, your shape, and what you're in now is just a negative. When you come up to around 20, 22 years old, you were a negative and, and death develops. Now listen, I, I don't want to contradict Brother Brandon, but I started losing my hair when I was 19. 22 is not a good number for me. But the point is what you were at your best in perfection was just a negative. And death develops the picture to the positive. That when this earthly tabernacle will be dissolved, we have one already waiting. This life was just a negative reflecting that one. And the negative was made off the positive in God's mind. And it's come down here in the negative form, and it's going through the darkroom process right now. Amen. And after it passes through the darkroom process, amen, it'll be formed into the positive image of the positive thought. And I will go to my theophany. He said, now... <clears throat> This just the display now, it shows what's being done. Like God becoming God when he created angels. He becomes son when he created Christ Jesus. He becomes savior when Jesus died. He becomes healer when he was wounded for our transgressions. With his stripes we were healed. See, all these things are attributes of God just so that in the end, the Bible said, Jesus said, you will know that I am in the Father, the Father in me. I in you and you in me. It's God becoming tangible. Next time you hug your brother, oh, it may be in a negative form. It may have not come to the positive form yet. It may have not gone through the process to go back, amen, to the positive form. But in its negative form, it's God becoming tangible. That's why we have to be so careful what we say about a brother or sister. So very careful. We have to be careful how we treat one another, how we speak about one another. And when we embrace one another, we have to realize this is part of God becoming tangible. <clears throat> it's God becoming tangible. Your own wife, you and your husband, is just a shadow, a negative of God and his wife, the church. 
See, it's just God's attribute being displayed in shadows and types like the Old Testament was to the New. Then in the end, it all winds up God tangible. God in Christ, tangible, made flesh. God dwelt among us. And in that great millennium to come, God in the form of Christ sits upon the throne of David and the church, his bride, husband and wife together, all tangible. Now let's turn. I want to read a a scripture here out of Ephesians chapter 3 together. And this Ephesians chapter 3 is a unique scripture. And I've read it many, many times and pondered over it and looked at it. But now, uh, just by the grace of God, I just see it differently. Ephesians 3 and 8. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. So there's a fellowship or there's a joint participation. There, there, there is a, a, a shared part in this fellowship, this fellowship of the mystery or of the secret that was in God from the beginning. So you have a part of that fellowship. So it make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Now, I, I struggled with this verse, verse 10, because of the way it's worded. It's very complicated, but, but by the grace of God, I, I see the understanding of it now. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. And what, what this verse is actually saying, if we, if we go back and we look at it in the literal Greek, you begin to understand. Uh, first, I want to interpret a word for you. Verse 9 is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world, that world means ages. And be, from the beginning of the ages have been hidden God who created all things by Christ Jesus. To the intent that now unto principalities, this word principalities means beginnings or origins or or the first or that which was in the beginning. And powers means jurisdiction or rulership in heaven. So to the originals, to the beginning, the first, uh, those with jurisdiction in heaven might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God. That means, may be known by the church, that the literal word means through the church. That now, what God is doing through the church is revealing the manifold wisdom of God to principalities and powers in heavens. This was a secret even in heaven, Brother Branham said. He said the angels didn't even know this. I mean, they didn't know what the seventh seal was. It was a total secret. But now it's being revealed through or by the church, the manifold wisdom of God. And who is catching this manifold wisdom? Principalities and powers in heavens. What's happening on earth, amen, is, is, is reflecting in heaven. What's happening on earth is part of a redemption cycle, amen, that's reconciling earth and heaven. So it's not... And it's not that the church is catching the manifold wisdom, but through the church is the manifold wisdom being expressed to principalities and powers in heavens. Because they couldn't imagine him doing it this way. They couldn't imagine him being so humble. Amen. They couldn't imagine him doing it this way to manifest his wisdom, this great secret that God kept in himself. And we know that that revelation was Jesus Christ. And we know that he come down as a baby in a manger and they were awed by that. And, and he was beaten and he was slain. Amen. But the most amazing part was that he would take from himself and form a bride. And then he would allow that bride to go through the church ages. And at the end, he would come down himself into that bride form, amen, so that he could unite the two back together. Amen, this is the manifold wisdom of God that's being revealed through the church. And heaven didn't even know it. And now it's being manifest by the church the manifold wisdom of God, how God will come in humility, how God will come down, amen, through his attributes because he'll never lose himself. 
He can send it in weakness. He can send it humility. He can send it in a broken condition. He can send it in such a way that nobody will believe that this is God. This is an attribute of God, and this is God bringing about a reconciliation. He can do it that way because God knows what he is, and he knows where his seed and germ is, and that will never be lost because it's a part of God. And God can sow it into absolute weakness. In an absolute weakness, he can overcome and reconcile all things into Jesus Christ. So now what are we doing? Manifesting the manifold wisdom of God. In what form? In bride form. God had a secret. He had a secret. He showed it from the beginning in the Garden of Eden. But that plan, that secret, amen, he's been unfolding now for thousands of years, but he's revealed that secret to you and I. He says, in the Smyrna church age, now then, here we are coming to a conclusion. As the eternal Logos, God was manifest in the Son and in Jesus dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, And that eternal one was the Father manifest in flesh and thereby gained the title of Son. Even so we, eternal in his thoughts, in our turn became the many-membered spoken word seed. Just like he became seed and son, we became spoken word seed and son. But I want you to understand spoken word. Though now manifest in the flesh are the, those eternal thoughts now manifest in the flesh are sons of God, even as we are so called. Amen. I want, to, I want to read another quote, and then I want to go to Revelation 10. Now compare God's Eden to Satan's now. After 6,000 years of perverting of the true interpretation of God's promised word to the age, let's compare it now and see where we get. Like he did to the church in Christ's time, in Jesus, trying to keep back God's loyal sons from knowing the truth. That's, that, that's God's. God put his sons here, his attributes, to fellowship with him by hearing the word. Catch that. I want to fellowship with God. How do you fellowship with God? You fellowship with him by hearing his word. Amen. That's why the message in this day has restored our fellowship back to God. Because God has revealed his plan of redemption. God has revealed uh, at the opening of the seals his whole plan. Amen. And by hearing the word, it restores us back to fellowship with God. What's he restoring us back to? The same kind of fellowship we had in his mind when the sons of God shouted for joy. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 10. Revelation chapter 10 and verse 7. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he had declared to his servants, the prophets. So in this day of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God, the mystery of God, there's a great mystery of God, and we have fellowship in this mystery. This is where we fellowship, is in this mystery, in this secret. That's what brings us together. That's what unites the attributes in fellowship, sharing a common purpose and and a common participation is in this mystery. That is where our fellowship is. And he says, and this mystery of God should be finished as he had declared to his servants the prophets. Now this term, as he declared to his servants the prophets, his servants the prophets have wrote the entire Bible. Who wrote the Bible? The prophets. So they wrote the entire Bible. That's why when Brother Branham comes to Christ as the mystery of God revealed, he is preaching Revelations 10.7. He is preaching the seventh seal. But he says, and he's preaching Revelation 10.7, the mystery of God. Christ is the mystery of God revealed. So this is the revealing of the mystery of God, and it's going to show Christ. And he says, Christ, and he said, in order to do this, I'm going to take from my context the entire Bible. What's he doing? He's preaching Revelation 10.7. That statement is coming right out of Revelation 10.7. He has to preach the mystery of God out of the whole Bible because God hath declared it to the prophets. 
So that mystery is laying in this Bible and that mystery is revealed in Christ. Amen. And don't forget that you're in Christ. That mystery is not just the male part, but it's the male and female part because within Adam was the woman, amen? And part of the beginning, the mystery in the beginning, the foreshadow, when he told the end from the beginning, he had male and female in his son, Adam, and in Adam was the part that was going to come out to manifest woman, and they were gonna be united as one flesh, and he was declaring the end from the beginning. What is this? The mystery of God, God becoming tangible. Wanting to fellowship as a family upon the earth. What is that? That's the seventh seal. That's the mystery of God. That's Revelation 10, 7. And in order to preach it, he's got to take the whole Bible because he had declared the mystery to all the prophets. He declared the mystery to all the prophets, but all the prophets didn't know what the mystery was. It was laying in mystery form in the Bible till a prophet could come at the end time and he could say, there it is in Adam and Eve. There it is in Ruth and Boaz. There it is, amen, in Rahab. There it is in Tamar. Amen, there it is in Mary. Do you see it? Do you see it? Do you see it? What is it? It's the mystery of God. Amen. He come forth as a son. The last Adam restored the fallen son, redeemed back all that Adam had lost. But within him was a woman, just like in the first time. And he had to take that woman out. She had to come into manifestation. And he had to be united back to her again. What's he doing? He's reconciling back in the plan of redemption. And this is the great mystery of God. Why? Because it was in his thought from before the foundation of the world and you're part of that thought and you're part of this plan. So you made a mistake yesterday. So did I. And the day before, and the day before, and the day before. But how am I gonna change this? How am I gonna stop this force from moving in my life? How will I will stop the unstoppable God from working his purpose and his plan and his own will in my life? I just have to repent and yield to him and say, God, I want to give you more than I gave you the day before. And tomorrow I want to give you more yet, Lord. I don't want this hybrid flesh to rule me. I don't want wrong thoughts. I don't want to be swayed by the enemy. But what I want to do is lay my life down. I want you to have preeminence because I love your plan. I loved it before the foundation of the world. I loved it in the opening of the seals and I still love it today. It's my identification, it's who I am, it's why I'm here, and I love it just as much as I did when I shouted in your mind before the foundation of the world. And God, anything I do, amen, contrary to that, I hate, and I lay it down and say, God, forgive me. But I'm not giving up what he's given me. I can't give up what he's given me. It was his eternal purpose. <laughs> Brother Brown says, I'm going to finish with this. I don't want to go any further. We'll pick it up some other time. I want to finish with this. In the Feast of Trumpets, he says, go into the prophet's chamber and watch them seven steps. Where did, where did the guard meet the challenge to bring the comer into the presence of the king? At the top of the steps. So at the top of the seventh step, on the seventh step, there's going to be somebody who's going to bring the comer into the presence of the king. Who's that? the forerunner ministry. It's Eliezer. It's the one introducing to Isaac. Uh, uh, he says here, now come up to seventh step. When you come up to the seventh step, there's a seventh church age messenger. And now that will bring you into the presence of the king. How will he bring you into the presence of the king? The king is the word. The king is the eternal word with the eternal purpose. Amen. And he brings you into the presence of the king by bringing you into the revealed word. And then you meet your bridegroom, your husband, your mate, Jesus Christ, the Word. At the top of the steps was in the seventh step. There shows that we've got to come again with the same spirit that was on John. He introduced the Messiah. He was greater than all the prophets. He introduced it. And we've got to come to a place again to something that's going to introduce the Messiah. What's introducing the Messiah? Bringing the person coming to the seventh step into the presence of the king. Next paragraph, and, and how will the Messiah, how will the people that believe him know it unless they're constantly in the word? 
to know what he is. Daniel said, the wise shall know, but the foolish, the unwise wouldn't know. They shall know their God. Now, 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 he shall appear in the last days is to bring the people back to the word so that the bride will know her husband, know her mate, the revealed word. How are you going to have fellowship with God by hearing his word? How are you going to be united into the fellowship you had before the foundation of the world? By the revealing of the word will bring you in contact with your bridegroom, with your mate, with your husband, the revealed word. It'll bring you into the presence of the king. It'll not unite you back to who you really are and bring us back to the basis of fellowship we had there. And that should bring us to fellowship with one another. See, we can try to manufacture fellowship. We need to have a fellowship meeting and we, had more, we need more fellowship in the church. And, and so we need more fellowship in the church so we're going to have a volleyball contest. That's not fellowship. That's friendship. That's fine. There's not, not, I'm not against friendship. But let's not call it fellowship. That's not fellowship. Fellowship is walking in the light as he is in the light, brings us back into that unity with our, bride, our, our, our bridegroom, our mate, the revealed word, and that's what brings us together in fellowship, friends. The friendship is part of it. The, the, the knowing one another, caring for one another, amen, that's all part of it, amen, but the real fellowship between the attributes of God is fellowship on the revealed word. Fellowship with God is, is hearing his word. Fellowship with Christ is coming to Christ, your mate, the revealed word. Fellowship with one another is when we meet each other there. I hope you understand that if we got, the only way to have fellowship is to walk in the light as he is in the light. You can't manufacture it. You can't make it happen. It happens. Amen. If you unite with Christ and I unite with Christ, guess what we're going to have? Fellowship. <laughs> you go up through that seventh step and you get ushered in, amen, by, 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 by Eliezer into the presence of the king. Guess what? That's where I'm at. Hey, brother, you're here. Amen. We're sitting here united with the king. We're sitting here talking to the king together. That's the basis for our fellowship, friends. That's the basis for fellowship in our homes. That's the basis for fellowship in our marriages. That's the basis for fellowship in our church is to get united in Christ, amen, to be part of the fellowship of this great mystery that unites us together with an eternal bond. The things that are only temporal, the things that are only earthly, they'll fall away. But these bonds that are eternal that go back to the mind of God, they'll stay. You have a marriage that has that kind of fellowship where both the husband and the wife are linked to Christ, have been ushered through the seventh step into the chamber of the king. I'm telling you, they'll weather every storm, friends. That's right. That's right. They will weather every storm. It doesn't mean that on the friendship side and in the outside, man, it doesn't mean there won't be turmoil or conflict or difficulty or, or he said, she said, your mom, your mom. I mean... Sorry, but that's the reality. <laughs> but the, if the fellowship is only based on those things, that fellowship will go up and down and up and down and up and down. But if you take two people who've made it into the inner chamber, amen, amen they may still have family pressures and outside pressures and financial pressures and disagreements, and, and, and that's all fine, but they will weather every storm because they have true fellowship. You take a church and the people in the church that are in harmony with the word, amen, they've all entered into the inner chamber, amen, you're going to have fellowship. You don't have to manufacture it. It will be there. You do the same thing in your home with your children, amen. You can't manufacture it. You love them. You take care of them. But if they start to enter into the place, you're, you're going to have fellowship for the rest of your lives. Amen. This is the basis for fellowship. Going in to the inner chamber together, finding ourselves as joint participants in the same thing, in the same mystery, participating in the community of the same thing. We each have our own part, but we have our part of the same thing. I'm gonna finish reading this quote of Feast of Trumpets. 
So the bride will know her husband, know her mate, the revealed word. That's why this has to happen. It wasn't in the reformers, wasn't in Luther, Wesley, and in Pentecost, and them scripture says it wasn't. But it will come. That is his promise for this age. We're living in this age that his coming will be in. She must be identified in him. Any woman must be identified with her husband for the two are one, and Christ's bride has to be identified with him for the two are one, and he is the word, not the denominational, the word. We are to be children of the light, and the light is the word which has made light for this age. How do we know light except it comes from the word? All right, the word made flesh is the light of the age when you see it, and the Bible said so. So if you walk in the light as he is in the light, you have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse you from all sin. But the, the word made flesh is the light of the age. What is the word made flesh? Can you raise your hand? Are you the light of the age? Are you the word made flesh? Are you that thought that he had before the foundation of the world of a bride in this end time? Is that you? Is that attribute inside of you? That portion of him that he portioned to be here in this day, to be that part of the word made manifest in a bride, in Jesus Christ, in the formation of the bride. Can you say I'm part of that? That is, the, that is the light of the age. That is the word made manifest. That is the light of the age. Amen. And if you walk in the light as he is in the light, you have fellowship with one another. I tell you, friends, I'm happy with this fellowship that we have. I don't want to manufacture it. I don't want to put on. I don't want to make believe. But I want the real fellowship that goes all the way down to the core so that when I irritate you so bad and you irritate me, we'll just flip it now. We're not going anywhere because we're in the same inner chamber. We're part of the same program. We're in the same fellowship of the mystery. We were in his mind. We were the one in his mind that when he laid out the plan, he said, this group over here, I'm holding you. Now, I'm just dramatizing, okay? I'm holding you back for the last. Here's my plan for you. He showed him the plan. You'll be this and you'll be that. And I want you to go down and I want you to go at the very end. And I want you to have a unique manifestation. Yes, Lord. And guess what, friends? You were there and I was there. Amen. That puts us in a bond of fellowship that can't be broken. Amen. When we disagree, we agreed there. Amen. If we disagree today on what color to paint a wall, it won't change the agreement we had there. It won't change the agreement that we have in our hearts, amen, that this is Christ and we love him and he's our mate. He's your mate and he's my mate. That makes you and I connected. Amen. He's my husband and he's your husband. That makes you and I connected. He's my lover and your lover. He's my king and your king. Amen. I meet him in the inner chamber. You meet him in the inner chamber. That makes you and I one. Amen. Makes him the whole thing. Praise God. This is, finish, this is finishing up in God's power to transform. Many times, man said, well, now, man wrote this Bible. No, the Bible says itself that God wrote the Bible. It's the word of God. And it never can fail. Jesus said, heavens and earth will fail, pass away, but my word shall never fail. And it cannot fail. And being God, because it's part of him. And then you being, you being a son or daughter, you are part of it. And that makes you a part of him. So that's why we come together. That's why we come to fellowship together around the word of God. Why do we fellowship? You're part of him. I'm part of him. This is him. This is the basis of our fellowship. We fellowship with God by hearing his word. We fellowship with one another by uniting with that word. You're the word. I'm the word. He's the word. He's the word. You're the word. I'm the word. I and you. You and me. I and him. He and me, Father and me, I and the Father, I and you, you and making them all one. Where do you find yourself in that equation? Wherever you find yourself is where I find myself, and that puts me and you together as one. Amen. That's why I love you. That's why you love me. 
Not because we always are in perfect agreement on every decision. Not because we don't have flesh and we don't have characteristics, but we love one another because we are united together in an inseparable bond that we can't get away from each other. And I like it that way. God is good. Let's all stand. Musicians, if you come, I'm just going to stop. I just feel to stop right there. I don't want to get into anything else. I'd like to stop with us loving each other. <laughs> Inseparable and united together and loving one another through a bond that cannot be broken. Amen. That's why John would say, by all this, but Jesus would say, well, this they will know you're my disciples when you have loved one for another. And John said, my little children love each other with a fervent love. I don't think he's telling you to manufacture anything. I think it's an outcrop of realizing who we are. Amen. I think it comes. Why is it when you meet a new believer and you sit down and you start to talk to them, all of a sudden it doesn't take you very long and, you've, and it feels like they're family? It feels like I have always known this person all of my life. Where did I meet him? How do I know him? How do I know her? She's, I know I know her. She said, we've never met. I, we never met. Were you ever here? No, I wasn't there. I was at the, did you go to that camp? No, I wasn't there. How do we know each other? Because we were there. Amen. We're in the mind of God. We're linked with the word. We come from the same family. Inside, we're the same thing. That's what unites us together, friends. If the, if the government breaks this house, breaks this building, closes the doors, whatever happens, it cannot break that fellowship. Amen. If we get scattered, if the doors close, whatever happens, it doesn't matter. He cannot break that fellowship. And I'll tell you, the name on the outside of the church can't break that fellowship either. Doesn't matter which one you drive to on a Sunday morning, this fellowship is bigger than a church building. This fellowship is bigger than a location. This fellowship goes all the way back to the mind of God and will go all the way to new heavens and new earth and we'll be dwelling together in the new Jerusalem, amen. It doesn't matter which building you walk into to worship God on Sunday, amen. If you were there, I was there. If you'll be there, I'll be there. You and I love one another. I say, praise God, Lord, I say, give me more of that. More of that. Don't let me get hung up by where somebody drives to church or, or, or some little disagreement on the way to do this or do that. Amen. Let me go deeper than that and say, were you in the mind of God before the foundation of the world? And if that brother says yes, I say, let me hug you, brother. Amen. <laughs> praise be to God, friends. That's the basis for fellowship. Amen. Well, praise God. Let's just stop. Let's sing. Brother Ben, sing. I'll stop preaching as you start singing. We'll walk in the light. It's such a trust another brother or sister is really our own insecurity. I'm just going to give you an example. 
If somebody disagrees with you on a doctrine in the message and they have a, a, a different understanding, not, not perverting the word, but just a different understanding of what Brother Brenham said. If we're not secure in who we are, we need them to be wrong and in order for ourselves to be right. And that attitude breaks fellowship. Because face it, friends, we're all growing in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. We're all seeing the message more clearly than we saw it a year before. There are things that God is continually opening to us and we're getting clearer understanding, not changing the whole message, but clearer understanding of what the prophet said. But so many times we're willing to break fellowship and, and, and break harmony with other believers and other churches because, well, they believe this and they believe that. But you know what, I don't care. Because what I believe is based off revelation. What God has revealed to me, if we are secure in who we are, there's nothing to fight about. You don't, we don't need for somebody else to be wrong, even in the church, sometimes in our own church, we'll have two ideas on how to manage something, how to accomplish a task, amen. And all of a sudden we have to make one wrong for us to be right. And then what's worse is with something totally natural that doesn't mean anything, amen, we'll have to spiritualize it. Trust me, friends, trust me. We we'll have to spiritualize it to find some spiritual reason for why mine's right and yours is wrong, and, and you know because the devil has this many letters in Lucifer's name, and I. It all comes off insecurity. Insecurity, where when you're really secure in your position with Christ, and then you're really secure in your calling and your election. I mean, if somebody disagrees with you, you say, okay, okay. I think we should do it that way, okay. And then they're gonna look at you like, you're not gonna argue? No, I'm not gonna argue. If that's the way you wanna do it, do it. I, I, I personally feel this way, but that's okay. When this message, you know, Brother Bram said this, and it means this, and you gotta see it that way. And you say, okay, that's fine. God bless you, brother, I love you. You're not gonna fight with me? Why would I fight with you? I just see it differently. But, but see, if you know that you were there in that conference, if you know you were there, if you know God is not complete without you, then even if I got it wrong today, he has to show it to me right. If it's imperative that I get the right understanding of this and I've got it wrong today, he'll make it right. But so many times we fight because we feel like I've got to have it right in order to be right. I don't have to have it right to be right. I was made right before the foundation of the world. I will come out right in the end. Even if my understanding is off, God will tweak my understanding. I don't have to fight for anything. I don't care sharing with you what I believe and hearing you share what you believe, amen. But the minute you try to force me into your mold or I force you into mine, amen, you're gonna break fellowship over what? God's in control. My question to you is, were you in the mind of God before the foundation of the world? Did you sing and shout with the sons of God? Then you're my brother, then you're my sister. We're gonna wind up in the same spot. You say, Brother Chad, how can you say that? What if they're wrong? Well, if they're wrong, that has nothing, that has no bearing on me making it there. And even me telling them, even me believing, if somebody says, yeah, I was there, brother, I'm a child of God, even me agreeing with them has no bearing on where I'm going. <laughs> even if they're wrong, even if they're lying, I'll just take them at their own testimony, at their own confession. You're a son of God, praise God, I love you, brother. Well, what if they're not? What if they're not? I mean, who cares? I'm still going to be in the city singing and shouting and dancing when the King of Kings sets upon the throne of David. It has no bearing on my outcome. It has no, makes no difference on my origin. My origin secured my outcome. What am I worried about what anybody else thinks or believes? Please, I mean, I hope you understand what I'm saying. I don't mean to be frivolous with that, but so many times we break fellowship over our own insecurity instead of just saying, God is my God, He is my Father, my position is secure. If I need to know something, He'll reveal it to me. If what you're saying is true, God will confirm it to me. I don't have to fight, I don't have to make you wrong, you don't have to make me wrong. 
Let's just love each other. Let's just do what John says. Let's just love each other with a fervent love and let God sort it all out. Let's stay in the word together. There's so many things that we know are true. Let's stay in them. Most of the things we fuss about are things that we'll never know anyways. Piece of this and a piece of that. Let's just say, let God reveal it. If he wants us to know it, it'll get clearer. It'll get clearer and clearer and clearer. But let's just love each other. Let's stay with the word. Hey, brother, are you in the inner chamber? Hey, sister, have you gone beyond the veil? Well, praise God, we're together. We love each other. Oh, I pray that God will give us a security, a real security in the soul that takes away all indifference and all, just a real security and a real joy. My name was on that Lamb's Book of Life from before the foundation of the world. How can I get upset? How can I doubt? Let that revelation bring joy. Let that revelation bring comfort. Let that revelation bring true security. Let's keep marching forward happy, happy and free and joyous and loving each other and having fellowship in the word and staying united to Christ and loving one another. Amen. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you, Lord. I thank you, God, for the revelation of who I am. I thank you, Lord, that you brought a prophet in our day and you ministered through that prophet. It was you, Lord. It was a son of man revealing the son of man. And you came so that you could give us a true identification of who we actually are. And God, we receive it by faith. You've revealed it to us as individuals and we believe it, Lord. Let that be the greatest truth that guides our lives, Lord. Let that be the thing that transcends everything else, Lord. That, 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 let that trump every other thought and every other circumstance, Lord. And let us have true fellowship, true fellowship in our marriages and in our families, on our homes, Lord, and in the church and in the bride. Let us have fellowship, Lord, as we unite with you. Let us keep lifting you up, Lord, and running to that word and embracing that word and uniting with it and loving you, Lord. May it transcend into a fellowship with one another. How we love you, Father, and how we thank you, God, for your goodness to us. How much we love one another with the true love, Lord, and how thankful we are for that. I thank you for my brothers and my sisters who are here, Lord, and the love that we have for each other. While we realize it's supernatural, God, may we never put it in jeopardy by our own insecurity, but may we be secure in you, Lord. Grow us into that image you had of us before the foundation of the world and make us what you want us to be. Let this revelation bring consequences. Let it bring changes in our thinking and in our speech. May it bring a new reality to us, Lord. And may it be the reality that we walk in. We ask it in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. God bless you, saints. I love you all. All ye saints of life.
my need Amazing grace Shall always be my song of praise For it was grace that bought my lips the sun.